So today we're going to discuss early Buddhism and why I think it's a good fit for contemporary belief and practice. Hi folks, I'm Doug Smith. I'm the study director at the Secular Buddhist Association, that's secularbuddhism.org. And today uh, we're going to discuss contemporary belief and practice, and in, in particular why early Buddhism is a good fit. If you're interested in issues of early Buddhism, of secularism, secular Buddhism, philosophy, these kinds of topics, please consider subscribing to the YouTube channel. Uh, you can do it below, or you can do it by clicking uh, the link at the end or uh, down in the corner. Uh, any of those will, will, will get you subscribed and, and you, you'll be able to see uh, more videos in the future like this one. So to begin with, what do we mean by early Buddhism? Uh, this is a big topic. It's a topic of some controversy, actually, which we won't be getting into. But basically the idea is the Buddha lived in the 5th century BCE, and uh, he left a large a body of material in, in the, the language called Pali, uh, which the, the body of material is called the Nikayas. Uh, it's a very large body of material. This, this also was translated into Chinese called the Agamas. And uh, this, uh, this material and its translations are collectively what we might consider the corpus of early Buddhism. There's a question about how much of it goes, actually goes back to the historical Buddha, but we can leave that question aside now. For, for our purposes, what we basically mean by early Buddhism is this collection of material in the Nikayas, Agamas, and those kinds of of texts. So why is uh, early Buddhism a particularly good fit for uh, contemporary secular belief and practice? To begin with, uh, in early Buddhism we find explanations of many of the practices uh, that we'll find a, in a Buddhist context. So for example, if we go to a contemporary Zendo nowadays, we'll often be told just to sit, we'll be told follow the breath. And in a Zendo that is perfectly uh, adequate instruction. In a sense, are looking for further justification for those kinds of practices as part of the problem that they, that they see themselves as trying to get around. But if we find ourselves more interested in wanting to know why we do certain kinds of practices, we'll find those uh, descriptions in early Buddhism. So for example, in early Buddhism we have the Anapanasati Sutta, which is a sutta about in and out breathing about about the practice and and giving some of the background as to why to do the practice in particular the practice of in and out breathing comes from another sutta or is, is related to another sutta called the satipatthana sutta which is uh, a sutta talking about mindfulness meditation so to begin with we we do in and out breathing in order to calm the mind in order to bring ourselves to a better state of being able to focus on the material of the mind and body in front of us breathing steady breathing Breathing, slow breathing helps to, to calm our, our, our scattered mind and bring us into more of a state of, of, of unified and calm investigation of what's in front of us. In and out breathing is part of um, what's called mindfulness of the body, being aware of the state of the body, uh, what position we're in, how we're moving. And this is a, a general way of getting a, a closer understanding of all of lived experience, because much of what we find in lived experience is reflected in our, our body and the way we're walking and the way we're behaving. We may, if we're angry, may, we may find ourselves becoming flushed. We may find ourselves feeling tense. These are all parts of uh, mindfulness of the body. Probably the e easiest way to, to get into that mindfulness of the body is through this kind of in and out breathing. It's a regular repeated state and as such it tends to induce calm. It's also a regular repeated state and so it's always with us. It's something we can always depend upon. So early Buddhism gives us uh, reasons for many of the practices and, and many of the beliefs we find within a Buddhist context. Also within early Buddhism, the, the Buddha is, is depicted as being fully human in most of the texts. There are some where he is depicted in a more divine light. Uh, those are probably texts that, that stem from a later period after the Buddha passed away. But nevertheless, uh, in most of the texts, he's, de he's depicted as, as fully human. He gets annoyed with uh, monks who, are, who misunderstand the Dharma that he's teaching. He gets annoyed at, at noise. If monks are making too much noise, he'll tell them to leave. Uh, this is a very, these are very human kinds of, of of examples. He experiences pain in some of the texts, especially later on in life he experiences pain. In some of the texts he even gets tired. There are texts in which he's going to give uh, a discourse, a Dhamma discourse, and is too tired or 
uh, too much in, in pain to do so, and so he allows one of his uh, senior monastics to do the talk. So this reveals a kind of poignancy to the early texts and a kind of humanity that we often don't find later on. In uh, another text, the Kevada Sutta, uh, the, the Buddha even satirizes the, the god Brahma, uh, which is one of the chief gods in the Brahmanic religion that was, uh, existed at the same time as, as early Buddhism. So in this, in this text, a, uh, a monk wants to know the answer to some grand question, and so he goes up to the, to the lower gods and asks them, what is the answer to this question? And the lower gods have no idea, so they tell him to go to talk to the higher gods. So he goes to talk to the higher gods, and eventually, through this process, he ends up uh, talking to the chief of all the gods, who's named Brahma. And the chief of all the gods, uh, to begin with, uh, tries to blow him off. Uh, basically, he says, I'm the chief of the gods, what do you want with me? Who are you to ask these kinds of questions? And the monk persists. And uh, like something out of a vaudeville routine, the god Brahma takes the, the monk all over to the side, sort of off to the side of, of the stage, as it were, and, and whispers to him, well, you know, I, I don't really know the answer to this question, why don't you just go ask the Buddha? And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny kind of a, a, sat, a satire of, of Brahmanic religion of, of the belief that the gods know all the answers to all the questions. In that same sutta, the Kevada Sutta, the, the Buddha also has a very interesting argument against uh, using miracles to attract adherents to his, uh, to his philosophy. So in that, in that sutta, a, a householder named Kevada goes up to him and says, look, you're not, having success, you're not having as much success as you would if you allowed yourself and your disciples to perform miracles, because the people love miracles, they'll come to you in great in great numbers if they if they can see that you can perform these miracles and the buddha has a, has a quite an interesting response basically he says look if if we perform miracles people are just going to say ah you did it with some you know with some silly magic and uh you know why should why does that mean that you're any kind of special person other than that you can use these kinds of tricks. Instead, the Buddha says uh, his miracle is the miracle of being able to teach uh, the right philosophy, the Dharma. And I mean, it's an inter it's a very, very interesting sutta because uh, one would expect, in, in all of these cases, in fact, a, a later believer in Buddhism would find it hard pressed to even suggest that the Buddha was incapable of performing certain kinds of miracles. Now, I mean, to be to be fair, in the Kaveta Sutta, the the Buddha does clearly believe that miracles are possible. It's not, he's not arguing against there being miracles or miraculous occurrences. Uh, as a person in the 5th century BC, he certainly was, he was not a disbeliever. Nevertheless, we might expect to hear a different kind of answer from him. We might expect to see him trying to wow this, uh, this householder Kavadha with, with miraculous kinds of examples, and he doesn't. It's hard to give a general flavor of early Buddhism and the texts of early Buddhism, particularly compared to uh, later texts that we might find in other uh, Buddhist traditions, but a, a good, I think a very good um, description of the difference comes from the eminent Buddhist uh, scholar Richard Gombrich, and I'll just read this passage from, uh, from his book because I think it, it does describe accurately the difference from somebody with very deep knowledge of, of these traditions. He says, to appreciate the Buddha's personal style in the Pali Canon, one could hardly do better than compare it with the Mahayana Sutras composed by his followers a few centuries later. In such texts as the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha appears in glory with a vast entourage and speaks literally ex cathedra, for he is enthroned with all that that implies. The tone is not merely authoritarian, but sometimes even strident. And this is, I think, an example of what we find in mature religious traditions of all kinds, that the founders become deified in a sense. Uh, they become more than being merely human. And as a result, the advice they give is no longer advice of one person to another, which is argued for and which has reasons for and against, perhaps, which we can come at from a human point of view, but rather advice that comes down from on high, ex cathedra, from the cathedral, from the, from the, the post of authority. It becomes uh, an argument from authority rather than an argument uh, as one person to another. Indeed, in later Buddhism, we find the, the Buddha becoming more and more deified. Uh, there's belief that that probably began within the early Buddhist tradition. In fact, there are examples of a sort of semi-deified Buddha within the, the Pali Canon itself, within the Nikayas, in what I believe and some of us believe are, are later uh, texts in that, in that corpus. But basically, we can understand that after the Buddha died, his followers would have had a certain amount of, of psychological difficulty and would have, uh, would have wanted to believe that he was still around in some sense. 
Also in later Buddhism, we find uh, the Bodhisattva ideal. And here is an ideal uh, in Mahayana Buddhism in particular, where one is supposed to uh, postpone one's uh, awakening uh, for multiple lifetimes, potentially an infinite number of lifetimes, in order to save all sentient beings. And while this may be seen, I think, as a laudable kind of, uh, of mental state to be in, nevertheless, it does require one to believe uh, in, in rebirth, in this kind of everlasting rebirth. And to the extent that we find that difficult, that kind of ideal in the later tradition may be of less, con uh, less congenial to us. So we should not consider that by going back to early Buddhism, we're going back to a tradition that is truly skeptical in a contemporary scientific sense. It's it's not. Uh, the, the, the Buddha did believe in rebirth. He did uh, clearly believe in uh, certain kinds of what we would consider supernatural kinds of occurrences and supernatural beings. And so while he was skeptical in comparison to other people around him, he, he was not skeptical in a contemporary modern sense. That said, those of us who find inspiration in these early texts also will probably find inspiration in the many ways that the Buddha was really exceptionally skeptical for his time. And I will give, you know, one caveat here, which is that what I'm talking about are my own personal interests, and not, not everyone's going to agree with my personal interests. Many, many secular Buddhists do find a whole lot of useful uh, both belief and practice in many of the later traditions, including the Tibetan tradition, the Zen tradition, and many others as well. Uh, although I believe that secular Buddhism is particularly well uh, oriented with the early material, uh, the early material is not for everybody. There's no collection of material that's for everybody. So if this is a topic that interests you, I'll put up in the corner here a uh, link to an earlier video I did uh, recommending some books on early Buddhism. And in particular, I would, I think, if you want to get a flavor of what uh, the, the early Buddhist texts are like, I would suggest uh, this book by Bhikkhu Bodhi and the Buddha's Words. It is a book that takes selected texts from the Nikayas, which is a large collection, so it's good to have a sort of a something smaller like this book. And uh, there's nothing equivalent to actually reading the text to get a, to get a flavor for them. I would also recommend uh, websites such as uh, Suda Central and Access to Insight, and I'll include those uh, down below as well. In those websites you can find uh, translations of most or all of the, of the Nikaya texts with background information on them, which might be helpful to you. If this kind of topic interests you, I would, I would suggest you consider subscribing to the, to, the, to the YouTube channel. And please do put your questions and comments down below. I'm always interested in anything you have to, to say. So thanks very much for watching, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thanks a lot.